Hey, good, good afternoon, everyone. So we're going to be doing a deep dive and an interactive session on Kubernetes multi-tenancy. Uh, my name is Sanjeev Rampal. I'm at Cisco. And I'm Ryan Bezicek. I'm a software engineer at Cray. So what we were thinking of doing was um, we have some slides, but I've got a bigger slide deck in the um, conference uh, agenda, which you can look at later and contact us. So we won't go over all of those slides. But uh, does the audience have a preference on how much slide versus uh, demo versus interactive discussion? We can make it any way. Yeah, so well, I guess first of all, who came to the intro yesterday? Anyone? Awesome. And who's been to a working group meeting before for multi tenancy? Awesome. And who knows nothing about multi tenancy at all? OK, awesome. So then I guess it's up to you. We can do slides. That's more kind of deeper level um, than in the intro. Uh, we have a demo that we will give as well. Um, or we can kind of have discussion of multi tenancy in Kubernetes, what people want, what people need, what people have, et cetera. Anyone have suggestions? Let's raise your hands for oh. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, so the panel, yeah, that's more for um, kind of the panel discussing how we are implementing multi tenancy within our companies. Um, and so that's kind of, we'll get into that. Um, this was, so th this was originally meant for, um, we did a, a meetup in the Seattle KubeCon, and a lot of people liked it, and so we had a very interactive people discussing. Um, and so this was kind of a more formal version of that. Um, but there are also a lot of people that are new to the working group, so we kind of want to cater to the audience. So um, who prefers like slides and kind of like higher level? Slides? OK. Slides so okay. maybe we'll do half and half. And if you feel like you need to see more slides or more discussion, we can adjust as we go. OK? So awesome. let's start off. Uh, you want to wanna... kick things off? Yeah. Oh, I don't have that. Okay. All right. So yeah, I guess we'll just do a few slides. Um, and then th this is a much bigger deck um, that you can look on afterwards. Um, we also have a lot of recordings um, on the YouTube channel that we've done. So most of this is kind of recap that we've done already in the community. Um, and then we will go through a quick demo, and then we'll do, we'll save about half the time for Q&A. Uh, so I guess the first thing is, you know, what is a tenant? Um, it means a lot of things to a lot of people. Um, I don't think I've heard two people say the same thing. Um, so the way we have decided is we have two kind of, we separate a tenant in um, our working group of a soft multi-tenancy and hard multi-tenancy. Hard is kind of you know, self-explanatory. You don't trust anyone. Soft is more you're trying to segregate your um, Kubernetes cluster for workloads that you don't really trust, but they're kind of within your organization, so you know that they're probably not going to do bad things. But you're really looking for kind of the noisy neighbor situations or um, separating like development groups, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so um, that's kind of what we call a, a tenant. Um, so, and most of the work we've been doing is on the soft multi-tenancy side um, to begin with, because um, as you can imagine, hard multi-tenancy is hard. Um, and as we've discussed, so this is in the intro, so a lot of you kind of know this um, already, um, but we don't, I guess from a hard multi-tenancy perspective, um, we agree that federation and multiple clusters and all that other stuff is a good uh, implementation for hard multi-tenancy, so we're not trying to solve those um, issues. We are trying to solve, you know, a single cluster hard multi-tenancy, you know, if we can. Did we lose? You want to do anything on this one? Uh, well, we kind of already covered the soft versus hard, so we can. So these are the four different kind of um, scenarios or options that we've kind of discussed within the working group for multi-tenancy, and uh, Sanjeev will kind of go into a little more detail of what they mean. So one thing we are doing in this working group is um, one set of efforts is different architectures for multi-tenancy, and we want to let the community develop each of those architectures. So we are not yet. Um, narrowing it down to it must be this approach. Then within those architectures, we have individual tracks. Okay, So these are four ways of looking at possible architectures for multi-tenancy in Kubernetes. Of course, you can have hybrids and so on, but this is a reasonable way to look at four categories. The first category is running multiple Kubernetes clusters on top of an IaaS. Right? So this could be vSphere as shown in this slide, but it could be OpenStack as well. And this is what a lot of customers, uh, users, tend to start off with. 
I already have an IaaS. I can create one cluster per tenant using my IaaS boundaries. Let's call that option A. That's one category of architectural approach for Kubernetes multi-tenancy. Option B is a single Kubernetes cluster, but an actual construct called a tenant per uh, multiple tenants within the same Kubernetes cluster, okay? And in option B, we introduce some new constructs like an explicit Kubernetes resource called tenant and some templating objects. And under those objects, under those new objects, we combine both existing resources like namespaces as well as some new Kubernetes resources which the community feels are appropriate for multi-tenancy. So that's option B, and we'll do a little bit more uh, discussion on that, and also we'll do a demo on that. This is also similar to what a lot of vendors do as ad hoc solutions for multi-tenancy today, right? So one of the, work, the goals of this working group is uh, there, there are lots of bits and pieces uh, in Kubernetes today for doing multi-tenancy, uh, namespaces, RBAC, uh, port security policies, network policies, but still there is no official direction from, the, from CNCF or Kubernetes community. Does Kubernetes support multi-tenancy? Yeah, kind of, but you have to kind of build it yourself. So one of the goals of this working group, and we would invite your suggestions for additional goals, but one of the goals is, well, let's see what kind of reference architecture can be done so that everybody can agree on a standard way of doing any of these architectures, right? So that's option B. Option C is a proposal uh, we recently got from Alibaba Cloud. That way, they brought it to the working group. And they said, well, why don't we run Kubernetes on Kubernetes, right? Instead of running Kubernetes on an IaaS, uh, they, they felt like a lot of users still want to have an entire Kubernetes cluster per tenant, right? Uh, so if, if every tenant wants to get their own full Kubernetes cluster, uh, but you don't want to run it on an IaaS, right? You want to have the whole solution be more cloud native, uh, there is something like option C. So the community uh, wants to see that work develop, so we will have more discussions on option C in future meetings of the working group. Option D is sort of a theoretical possibility right now, which is rewrite core Kubernetes to introduce the concept of a tenant right into core Kubernetes, okay? So uh, whereas option B was sort of adding new custom resources on top of existing Kubernetes, option D is uh, going to the core, uh, core uh, Kubernetes groups and saying, we need to embed the concept of a tenant right into the Kubernetes APIs. So just like OpenStack, right? In OpenStack, every API call to Nova and Neutron has a tenant ID in there, right? You are actually making calls through in the context of a tenant. That's a first class citizenship, right, in OpenStack of tenants. Kubernetes was never designed to have tenancy as a first class resource, right? So option D would be going back and adding tenancy as a first class resource into Kubernetes. So you can imagine that that will require major surgery to Kubernetes, and that's why that is for now a theoretical possibility. If there's sufficient interest in the community, hopefully that can be developed further. So at this point, the working group is saying, these are the categories of solutions, and we're not eliminating any of these at this point because each have value, but then wherever we find contributors willing to spend more time and resources, that track gets more development. So right now we're developing the option B track a little bit more, okay? And then hopefully we'll see option C develop more as uh, we get contributions from Alibaba and others, yeah. So all of these involve some sort of tenant isolation. The degree is different in different, in different solutions, right? So for example here, there is a shared Kubernetes API server, but uh, separate namespaces. So uh, in terms of VPN, like all of them have some level of network isolation. Uh, do you want to be more specific on the particular kind of Yes. For example, like internal 
when I'm ordering for my friends. Yes. I don't want it to be publicly accessible. So if I trade an ingress there uh, in an internal, uh, so those things, uh, like yeah. how do I have... Those can, I, I believe, and let's uh, continue further, but I believe that particular requirement can actually be met by all of these architectures. But uh, feel free to discuss if you feel it doesn't match your expectations. So let's keep going. So we're going to skip over some of these slides because uh, we want to have more time for Q&A. So there's more de details on comparison of these architectures, which you can look at later. Um, I'm also going to skip over this slide because this says, well, if, if somebody says, I have to do a multi-tenancy solution today, what do I do? Well, you can do a hybrid solution as well. You can combine options A and B, where you can say, well, for those, con those applications that really need privileged containers, I want to use dedicated clusters. But on the same infrastructure, I can have shared and dedicated clusters. And for those applications where soft sharing is possible in that same infrastructure, I can have shared clusters. But again, I'll, for keeping uh, the discussion going, I'll uh, let you all look at it later. Uh, this is a little bit more detail. Uh, Ryan, you want to add to it a little bit on uh, yeah. option B? Yeah, so this is really the option B that we've been implementing. Um, and I guess it's kind of to go back to some of your questions before. So all of this is running in the same Kubernetes clusters, right? And so, and what we're doing is, um, as Sanji mentioned, is we're really kind of putting the tools together to build multi-tenancy within it. Um, but the tools are the native t Kubernetes tools, so network policies and OPA and those sorts of things. Um, so if you do need uh, inter-tenant communication, that's not prevented here. Um, it's just a matter of your, I guess, implementation of it. Uh, and so this kind of describes how a, a Kubernetes cluster would work uh, in you know, the, the uh, option B that we are building. Um, tenants can span multiple worker nodes. You know, you could always use you know, affinity and anti-affinity, et cetera, to segregate things as you need. Um, but um, it just kind of sees how um, a tenant looks kind of at a higher level. Yeah. Key point here is tenant in covers multiple namespaces. It's not one-to-one -one mapping between namespace and tenant. OK? Yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah. Okay, so a quick recap of the two questions. One, what about cluster scoped, um, you know, uh, uh, resources, I guess, in just, and two is why not just skip to option D because of these issues, right? What was that? Yeah, how is it? Well, I mean, the difference is, right, option D requires significant changes to API machinery, the kubelet, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, uh, you know, who's going to fund that um, is really the question. Uh, so that's, and that's it, right? We don't want to try to um, solve everything today. We want to um, provide solutions in the short term while we can tackle those um, because they are big undertakings. Um, and you know, we also need, I guess, the community involvement to say that's what we want. So there's a lot of people that don't think option D should be part of core Kubernetes. Um, and so it's, it's really up to the community to say, yeah, we think that it should be there. Uh, and so our option B is kind of our compromise to until we can gather the, you know, the requirements and the, I guess, the, the the interest from the community to actually implement it. So that's kind of the reason why we not go to option D. And the first question, you know, cluster, um, yeah, we haven't really solved that. That's really the answer, right? So that's, that's most of the discussions. If you go back to the last few weeks of our, of our working group meetings, we've been discussing that. How do we solve, you know, cluster scoped resources? Um, and kind of the answer so far has been, 
you know, it's really hard. And even, you know, the Alibaba solution, um, they haven't fully solved that either, but they're working on some things. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's come to our meetings and then we can discuss it and one, solve it One together. initial thought is that uh, in option B, tenants will never get any cluster scope resources at all. It's a restrictive model. You can only get namespaced resources in option B, and even you cannot necessarily get all namespaced resources. Okay, it's a, depending on how conservative you want to create the security profile. So we also have the notion of, well, having a few reference security profiles, and if you want one particular reference profile in which a tenant only gets namespace resources and doesn't even get, for example, network policy namespace resources, because there's a chance that a malicious tenant or a, uh, in, you know, by mistake, they can actually write network policies that break the namespace boundaries. So you do not want to give in. So yes, all of those are valid points. They come into the precise documentation of the security profiles. So let's keep, uh, let's keep that discussion going. Um, so this is a quick, uh, now talking about the specific demo that we're going to uh, briefly show you. Uh, although these uh, personas kind of apply to all these models, really. So let's think of it in this manner, that there is a cluster admin, there is, there is X number of tenant admins, and then there are tenant users, right? So again, we want to make sure that you as users uh, think this, these are adequate uh, workflows, or if you have ideas for other workflows that the community should support, then please bring them to us. So in this, in this workflow, a Kubernetes a cluster admin provisions um, the cluster for the first time with one of N recommended security profiles, right? So the, you, the cluster needs to have baseline security uh, in order to even support multi-tenancy. So a baseline security profile may say, you must have fraud security policies enabled, you must have RBAC enabled, uh, you must have, um, you know, etcd secrets encryption enabled, otherwise this cluster doesn't even qualify for multi-tenancy, right? So the cluster admin sets that up, and then the cluster admin also provisions template objects. Uh, so we've, thought, we've considered that there would be tenant template objects and namespace template objects. In the demo, we'll show namespace template objects. And these are the templates that the cluster admin says should be, uh, these are curated templates which they want all users and all tenants to use. Once the cluster has, admin has done that, any user can self-service create tenants, okay? So we do not want to have a process where you have to open a ticket in order to create a tenant. It should be a self-service model, right? So any authenticated user who is presumably also going to be a tenant admin eventually should be able to create a resource called a tenant and refer to one of these tenant templates that have been pre-created for him by the cluster admin, right? So this user, referring to the tenants, creates the uh, tenant templates, uh, creates uh, the tenant object, and also identifies the admins and uh, access controls for that tenant object, right? So, one, so the model we are uh, thinking of right now is Anybody can create tenants, but once a tenant is created, um, during the creation of a tenant, you decide who has subsequent CRUD permissions on that tenant, right? So we use named RBAC policies in the prototype. There could be other ways of using OPA and so on for doing it, right? Um, so that's kind of the workflow. And then uh, subsequently, um, tenant admins can only perform CRUD operations on tenants that they own. So a tenant admin cannot step on another tenant and so on. So uh, hopefully the, this will be even more clear uh, in the demo. And then finally, you know, here are the reference profiles we are working towards. Again, we would love your input on whether these make sense. But uh, the first profile is essentially mostly leveraging functionality that already exists in Kubernetes, right? And in the second profile, which we want to track upcoming functionalities such as uh, new runtimes like Cryo and so on, and uh, dynamic policy engines like uh, OPA, and that would be another reference policy that uh, security profile that uh, we would uh, collectively produce as a reference in the working group. With that, let me just switch to the demo, and then we'll have open Q&A after that. 
Uh, there's more slides here in the deck, which I would encourage you to look at later, but these describe some more about the architecture, the sample um, uh, tenant specifications, and so on. Okay, and we also have some uh, information on the kinds of topics that the, the working group is currently working on, and we would love your in, uh, input, contributions, suggestions, and so on. Okay, uh, the demo was actually prototyped by Yisui Hui from uh, Google. He couldn't be here, but thanks to Yisui for doing all the work around this controller. So that's what I'm gonna be demoing. Uh, I was gonna do a live demo, but I tried it yesterday and the VPN was slow, so I'm just gonna run a recording if that's okay. I do have the live cluster here in case we want, anybody has any questions, you wanna go back to look at the live cluster, but let me for now just run the recording. Oh. Different uh, display, I suppose. Okay. Okay. So uh, what we are demoing here is a prototype um, controller and a few CRDs to implement option B, right? Uh, or a subset of option B. Okay, so let me just run it and explain it along the way. Um, so the first thing is I've already installed uh, the cluster as I said, the cluster admin needs to create the cluster with a default security profile already, right? So the first thing we notice is that uh, this cluster has new API resources. In this, in this uh, POC, we've got namespace templates and, and tenants, the last two uh, when we do the API resources, right? So the cluster admin would pre-create these um, additional objects and also pre-configure the recommended security profile, right? That's day zero provisioning. Uh, we, uh, in this cluster, is using a security profile similar to the profile A we showed earlier. So we've got pod security policies enabled, for example. Um, two pod security policies enabled, one for privileged tenants and restricted tenants, very similar to the documentation already there in the Kubernetes documents about you know, privileged pod security profiles and restricted pod security profiles. Uh, the next thing we're gonna do is create a namespace template. Right, so here's the namespace template in this demo. Uh, you can see that, now let me explain this templating a little bit more here. So a namespace template is a very uh, flexible way of defining what all policies the namespaces of this new tenant ought to have. You could have a tenant with four namespaces and each of them having a different namespace uh, template or all four having the same, policy, uh, same template. Um, in this case, we are saying, we're creating a template which says all namespaces belonging to tenants with this profile, uh, with this template, should use this uh, port security policy, right? So the same restricted port security policy we showed earlier. Uh, and we say that this is, the, the subjects are gonna be the service accounts. So all service accounts in the namespace that uses this template will, will automatically use this pod security policy. We could also have added a network policy similarly to this template, right? So uh, the cluster admin has decided that this is my desired um, level of namespace templating, and I'm going to pre-create these. Um, users would normally not be able to pre-create these. Uh, but then they can self-service their tenants using these templates, okay? So let's keep going. Um, so, so that was a look at the namespace template. So now the cluster admin decides to instantiate the namespace template. So it's created this uh, template called restricted. 
um, and there it is. The next thing we now now we are um, looking at the role of any tenant user, right? So um, so a tenant a tenant admin or really any authenticated user. Uh, we could refine this further. We could have restricted users who, who you know a subset of users that can only create uh, tenants and so on. But essentially, this is a self-service model. So they're going to use this kind of a manifest to say, OK, I want to create tenant A with two namespaces, NS1 and NS2. Both of these are going to use the namespace template restricted. And the admins of this tenant are going to be everybody that belongs to the RBAC group tenant A admins. right? So um, I did not need to, th this is a self-service model. I'm creating a tenant and pre-specifying the admins. right? But I'm, I'm using the infrastructure definition that the cluster admin has enforced, right? So it's a combination of centralized uh, policy control with distributed self-service. So we're going to go ahead and actually create that tenant. There it is. And then, um, let's see, there, that's, that's the tenant here. OK, so now look at the namespaces here, right? So we said that in the template for this, uh, in the specification for this tenant, we said we want two namespaces with templates uh, matching this particular uh, pre-created tenant. And so we actually created two namespaces, but we, in the current prototype, we prepend the tenant name to the namespace name in order to make it unique so that um, you know any a bunch of tenants can create their own namespaces but we don't want to have clashing namespace names um, namespaces are required to be globally unique within the cluster so in the current prototype we are prepending uh, the tenant name to the namespace name um, there are some pros and cons of this which we are still discussing in the group but uh, for now this is what we're doing in the prototype Um, as we develop more flexible admission controllers and mutating admission controllers, whether through OPA or whether through other methods, we would be able to embed these tags in more flexible ways. So, um, so now the tenant is created, and we are just trying to you know, see whether this is actually a sandbox tenant. right? So we tried to create a, uh, a privileged container in the, in the tenant. And if you recall, the template had the restricted port security policy, so the tenant could not create um, a, um, a deployment which had um, a container that needed to run as root. Because what we are recommending initially is a completely sandboxed policy, no privileged containers, no running as root, and so on. It so happens we've also created a privileged tenant here, just to, as an illustration. And it so happens that that privileged tenant can, in fact, create uh, privileged containers. Normally, we would not recommend mixing privileged uh, tenants and non-privileged tenants in the same cluster. That's when you would have the hybrid solution of option A and B, where you would give, give those uh, containers their own uh, dedicated cluster. Right? So, so that's it. That was a, a kind of a quick demo. Uh, hopefully, you all get a, got a feel for this prototype, this is just capturing some ideas that the group has been throwing around for option B. As we said earlier, we're going to continue uh, encouraging collaboratively the development of all of these options. And we would really love lots of user input on areas that we should be focusing on. What helps you as a uh, cluster admin? Uh, how do you, what do you think should be added uh, to the uh, output of the working group? And we would love to have you directly contribute in any way. So with that, we're going to open it up to Q&A, right? Uh, right? Questions? All right. yeah. I'm going to do the mic because these are longer questions. So I mean, I love your multi-tenancy ideas, but I think that you, I mean, you definitely live in right now the end end user who will be member of, like, who will be under the even tenant user. And I feel that, like, 
I, I was thinking, as a tenant user, I probably want to, let's say, create ingress, create volume, and I don't want to specify any classes, and I'm not sure how it fits in your multi-tenancy model where like, tenant A will have one default ingress, default storage class, default something, and then B will have different default storage class, different default ingress, different default, different defaults for objects. Uh, I have some thoughts on it, Ryan. Yeah, so, well, firstly, we, we mentioned that we have pre-created templates, right? So you would pre-create templates, and then additionally, uh, you would be able to either via RBAC or via things like OPA decide that tenant A only gets to use template 1, 2, and 3, and tenant B gets to use templates 4, 5, and 6. So you can have things like, okay, tenant A can only pick from these templates, and tenant B can only pick from those templates. As we develop it further, we'll have lots of opportunity for such flexible. Uh, yeah, and it's, it's also important to note with this, um, we are also working on a set of, I guess, not really conformance tests, but kind of conformance tests for tenants that you can run against your cluster when you do these so that you can kind of see a checklist of, yes, I meet those needs. Um, obviously, that's also a pretty big undertaking to say that, yes, you've got the stamp, um, but that's something that we're working on as well. But uh, let's have continued discussion because, uh, you know, we would love to get all this valuable input captured in our roadmap. Any other thoughts? Hi. So a uh, very interesting model. And in this kind of model, how would you go about the scenario uh, of self-service delete? Like if a user wants to delete a namespace that they own, uh, how can you express that in our back? Oh, so if that user matches the admin RBAC group set up for that tenant, then the, the user can just say kubectl DL, delete uh, tenant you know, foo. It's self-service for creation and deletion. So uh, the, are, the, are the tenant objects created in a namespace that only that user uh, owns? Because yes. Oh, OK. Yeah, yeah, so, exactly. So we used RBAC on named resources. So what happens is, initially, every cluster user has create permission for tenants, but not update or delete permissions. So anybody can kick off the creation, but as part of the creation, you specify the list of admins that can do subsequent operations. Those additional users will be able to do updates and deletes. So I can create tenant A and say only users 1, 2, and 3 can delete tenant A or modify it. Somebody else can create tenant B. I wouldn't be able to delete tenant B, nor would they be able to. So it's, uh, if you look in through the details, yeah, we use uh, name resources and, uh, to implement this. Can I, so can I also add to that? Uh, so, yeah, so if you go back to our, one of our slides, we had the different personas. Uh, so in your question is, how do you delete a specific namespace, not the whole tenant, is my understanding, right? Yeah, so, so yeah, in that situation, you basically need to be basically that tenant admin level, um, and then you can modify the tenant to delete a namespace, because so, you, prov you, provide, you provide the namespaces you want added, and so that's, that's how that's handled. Um, uh, it, it, but it, at the end of the day, again, it, it comes down to RBAC, right? Um, but from deleting and creating namespaces within a tenant, it comes down to that tenant, you know, tenant admin uh, uh, RBAC role. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah, let's continue. Um, we really would love to have a lot more uh, user input because you can completely shape how this work goes. We're still in a very, very early stage. And, um, you know, we welcome all feedback as saying, hey, you know, the existing Kubernetes constructs are enough. I just want reference profiles. Or no, they're not enough. I want these kinds of CRDs. However you feel would be most useful, that's how we can take this forward. Hi, uh, I would like to change a little bit the subject and ask about, uh, for example, if uh, we want to have multi-tenancy and we want to restrict a specific tenant to be in some specific nodes, 
so that he doesn't affect other tenants, yeah. is what would be the way in order to implement such thing and if that would be possible with his model? Yeah, yeah. So, so using, um, you know, things like uh, no taints and um, um, having policies that say that, um, let's say it could be like this namespace in this tenant is exclusively using these two nodes. Uh, maybe you have some privileged containers in that, in just in those ten namespaces and you need to allow that. So that is certainly possible. Again, it's, it's setting up the templates and the security profiles, which is giving the instrumentation. You can set up the profiles to do that. So, um, hi. I like the idea of plan B, actually, and the reason we have been discussing internally a lot about, about this problem. So simply what we had, we had uh, this missing hierarchical, you know, second level from having a namespace at top of it and how I can deal with quota and resources yes. in an automation way. So I don't want every customer to contact the cluster admin and ask him to create a namespace for me. Yeah. I would like to create just one project level, whatever we call it, and then give them an admin rights and they can deal with users, quota, do everything. Yeah. So which is excellent. That's yeah. definitely this is what we are looking for and I'm happy to start seeing that it's coming. Mm -hmm. What about the quota resources? So I know that we can set it at the level of the project or the tenant. Does that impact the namespace itself in a way that when I'm giving them six, let's say, CPU and X number of, of gigabyte of memory, can they still, the admin of the tenant, really distribute these between the namespaces underneath? Thank you. Yeah, so I mean, right now, we can at the tenant level, so you can set it, um, but it would basically have to duplicate per the tenant yet, or through the namespace. Um, so that's something we've actually discussed quite a lot of. That's the number one ask, really, of other people is we don't really care about multi-tenancy. We just want to do basically resource quotas for multiple namespaces so that, you know, you know, test and prod or test and staging can run in the same, et cetera. Um, so yeah, we're talking about it and we're looking at those implementations, but right now it's basically you have to set it still at the namespace level within your, your tenant. And so it, it, yeah, we haven't really figured out the details of how you could do that at tenant creation, how a cluster admin can kind of provide that. Um, and that's kind of what the next steps we're, we're, we're kind of getting into as now that we have kind of a POC, we can take that a little further, so. That, that's definitely on the radar uh, as one of the immediate next things to do. I think we had some folks volunteer on the group as taking the lead on that. So, so if you would like to, to exactly, participate. As an input, I mean, the way yes. that we would like to see is simple, that we would like to see the quota goes at the tenant level, yes. and the admin of this tenant is capable to just distribute it the way the project is required or they need. So yes. we don't have to deal with that. We would like automation at all levels. Thank That's you. absolutely the goal. And, it, the, and the, the quota would be uh, not tied to a particular namespace. It is across all the namespaces within that tenant. So the thought is to develop a new admission controller which tracks the usage across those namespaces. So it doesn't matter if you, uh, the namespace themselves doesn't, we don't match it against the quota. We aggregate the usage across all the tenants and that's, so the, the task there is to actually write uh, some, an admission controller which right now, uh, it's a, a task on the roadmap. But the tickets are not assigned, so assign stuff up. Hi, um, I work at Lloyd's Banking Group. Um, right now, IBM are creating a Kubernetes cluster for a lot, a lot of the bank um, using IBM Cloud Private. And that's the problem that they've been discussing for quite some time, is just how to do that. And what they've come up with is dev, test, and pre-prod namespaces. And then within that, they're controlling the resources from that so you don't actually get access to control the tenant level. So it's just namespace level that we can control. We can't control anything within the cluster and we can't yeah. control anything within the tenant. And uh, so yeah, so that would address that as well. Uh, again, um, we find that many cluster admins have done their own custom solutions. So we would love to just 
take whatever is out there and just kind of having a common reference because everybody has the same problem. It's just that they're either doing some custom automation and we, in the working group, we can say, well, whatever helps the community. If the community says, I already have the solution, it works for everybody, we just standardize that, right? So we just qualify that and so on. So, yeah. Um, I was just wondering if there were any thoughts on um, securing the API server. Uh, more because in a multi-tenant environment, um, if the API server is compromised, then the tenant has access to all of the. Yeah. Other so tenants. currently, you have rate limiting in the API server, and um, you can uh, set up. There, there isn't direct automation already, but you could set up rate limiting per tenant. So I'm, I'm not talking about uh, denial of service. I'm talking more about uh, privilege escalation and uh, compromising the cluster. So. At the moment, the API server handles authorization and authentication, and once you get access to the API server, you have access to the entire cluster. Yes. Right. Um, so there's no, uh, there's no authentication or authorization beyond the API server. Right? So I would say, and we can certainly continue discussing this, but I would say that that's part of the base cluster hardening. Uh, you want to protect the API server no matter whether it's a single tenant cluster or a multi-tenant cluster. Yeah, um, but it, it becomes more important when it's multi-tenant, right? Because right, right. So um, here we would leverage best practices in the industry for API server protection. And we would possibly document them in the, in the ref, um, security profiles uh, output of this working group as this is what we would recommend uh, for protecting the API server in a multi-tenant configuration. Uh, but again, that is baseline security with or without multi-tenancy. H Mac. H Mac is a messaging alert from this uh, encryption in the, in the API calls. So with with option B, yeah. there is no tenant identification in the API calls. That would be something like option D, where that there's a tenant ID embedded in every API call. That requires a lot more work. Uh, but option B, the tenant ID is derived from, I mean, this is just like, you know, Kubernetes doesn't have user IDs, you, right? You don't even have the concept of users to begin with. So the API calls, uh, so the option B follows that kind of model. Uh, hi. Um, so basically, I very much like the idea of having uh, something like namespace templates. Um, at my university, we are in a scenario where we drive um, the author authorization through an external system. So we are basically running a GitLab instance, and we want to automatically create tenants based on changes at this external system. And this is quite difficult for us, because now we have this idea of templates, and we want to dynamically create these templates based on changes in GitLab. So. Any yeah. thoughts on this or coupling? Uh, so come again. You say you want to dynamically create templates. Yes, right. So, like we are in a scenario where we want, don't want to like provide a self service for students where they can uh, create tenants on their own. We want to have an external system where we have all identity management inside and automatically create tenants through the system. So again, this is a great use case. Please uh, let's talk either later today or please come, uh, come to the working group meetings and uh, you know, provide these requirements. We would love to get your input and incorporate that into future work. Yeah, so, so I'll repeat, to yeah, to repeat the question. Yeah. Uh, so what about basically real hard multi-tenancy within a single cluster, right, to sum it up? And then go ahead. You can yeah, no, go ahead, Ryan. Ryan. <laughs> so, right, I mean, again, so that's, you know, that's our goal, right? That's, that's what we want. But Kubernetes was not 
built for that from the ground up. Um, it, there was no thought put into it, um, or it, there was and they decided they didn't need it. Uh, and so it's going to be a lot of rework to get that there. And even, you know, even if we do have an alpha for it, it's going to be years before we actually harden it to the point where you know, it could realistically be considered hard multi-tenancy. Hard multi uh, the current, I guess, best practice is multiple clusters. Um, you know, separate API servers because you know hardening that is also difficult. So that's kind of the current, you know, community um, thing. But that's our goal, right? So that's what the working group wants eventually. Um, and so we urge you to come and voice and complain that you want it. We've talked to the yeah. API server team, and they say, well, we we are looking for people with the bandwidth to do that because that's a significant rearchitecture. Oh. Did this go back to what OpenStack? Yes. So, Last question. Uh, this is I have here. do you think you can ev evolve model B to support health multi tenants? Will be easy to do with model C with virtual servers? Yes. Okay. So, so we look forward to see how model C develops over the next few months. So that's why we say we are keeping all these tracks open, right? Nothing is eliminated at this point. We'll make progress on whichever track we find more community contribution. And again, I want to keep reemphasizing this is at a stage where all of you can make a major difference, bring all your requirements, uh, suggestions, criticisms, and let's figure it out together. So we are like way past time, so we'll close and we can come up after for questions. Um, but again, we've been discussing also, we understand that uh, Europe is not really well suited for our current time slot that we meet uh, bi-weekly. Uh, so I think we're going to send out a poll to see you know, who from around the world really wants to show up. And so we might be changing our time to accommodate. So I guess look out for that. Thank you. <laughs>